good to see you. It's good to worship with you. Uh, so I have here my myself. <laughs> I'm my friend Devin. Hi. Hey, I'm Devin. <laughs> so it's awesome. It's always great to have her with me because sometimes when I'm by myself, I'm just singing. And, uh, so Devin is awesome, and she's going to play. She's going to accompany us through this time. So we're just going to get right into it. We're going to sing. We're going to worship the Lord in this time through song. So uh, sing along with us. You'll have the words there as well. So follow along. build 
you are the Holy One. You're worthy of all our praise. Guys, we just sang everything we have comes from you. The very breath that we breathe in, we draw it out and we give it back to you, Lord. We give you our lives. Lord, we know without you, Lord, we're just kind of wandering, trying to figure out what's this all about? Lord, I read stories about people looking to the stars to try to tell them what life's meaning and purpose is. I had someone the other day say to me, what's your sign? And I said, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. They said, you know, your astrological sign. I said, I don't know, and it doesn't really make a difference, does it? And it doesn't. It's meaningless, God. You are the one who set the stars in motion. Lord, those things give uh, declare that you are God and, and give you praise, Lord. And so we build our lives upon you, the only secure foundation in the entire universe, the one who spoke all things into being. So God, we worship you this morning and pray that you were honored and that you were lifted up. Lord, we, uh, we ask that uh, we just take this time to focus on you and give you the praise that you are so worthy of. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing, How Great is Our God. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice Sing yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Hi, everybody, and welcome to Quail Lake Community Church. I'm glad you're here today. We're on our last message in 2 Corinthians. We've done 13 weeks now, and so we've got our final one. And as a matter of fact, our title today is Last Words. And so I'd like to start us off with a word of prayer. We've had some good music, and now it's time to come to God's Word. So let's ask God to speak to us in this final message on this great letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. You're a great and awesome God, a God who loves us and a God who really loved these people too. And I pray that you would really speak to our hearts with, um, just with your message today. It needs to be yours, Lord. And, and we ask that you would remind us again and again of how important all that we're doing here really is, that the stakes are so high and the consequences are eternal. And so, Lord, we thank you that you, you want us to know this and that, Lord, you make it easy for us to understand and to be able to make a part of our lives. And so as we come to this message today, this last one, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be the teacher. And we ask, Lord, that for us, as we come, that we'll bring whatever we've been through this week. We've all been on our own journeys and Lord, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, struggles you've had, joys you've had, victories you've had, whatever it is, that you bring it now. And then we'll wait to see how God speaks to us. So thank you, God. We welcome you here. and We look forward to you speaking to us. And we pray it in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, our title is simply Last Words. It's the last chapter here. And, you know, we're going to start off with something. Have you ever heard the phrase, Third time's the charm. Have you heard that? I bet you've even said it, haven't you? Well, you know, the third time's the charm. And, and you, know, uh, you know, where did that come from? You know, is there some significance, something, you know, back somewhere? And, well, you know, I did some research on that. And what it's believed is that it was this sense that because of the Trinity in Christianity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how God reveals himself to us, that threes were really good stuff. And when you got to that third one, that was going to be really, really good. And so, as the Apostle Paul closes this letter to the Corinthians, he says, I'm coming to this church for the third time. But it may not be the charm that they expect or we expect. And as a matter of fact, our first point is going to be the third time is not the charm. Let's take a look. We'll start with verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to visit you. And as the scriptures say, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I've already warned those who've been sinning when I was there on my second visit. Now I again warn them and all others as I did before. The next time I will not spare them. Well, Paul starts off kind of, kind of boy, I'm ready to go here saying that this is his third visit to these folks. And notice what he does. He talked about this witness thing. What he's doing, he's drawing on something from the law of Moses, from the Old Testament. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Listen to what it says. You must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So what the law of Moses was saying is that you can't convict anyone of a crime on the say-so of just one person. You need to have at least two, preferably three. And we see it in the New Testament, too. Jesus even talked about that. In Matthew 18, he said, But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Now, why are we talking about this? What's going on here? Well, right out, the, out of the chute, Paul is treating this visit to the Corinthian church as kind of like a courtroom battle. And, and he's saying, no, nope, you know, I came once, came twice. This is the third time. It's almost like the third witness, if you will. So what's the fuss all about anyway? I mean, uh, what, what, what's, what's driving all this? Here's what's going on. The whole picture here is that the Corinthian church has started with the gospel. They got this message straight from Paul. And we ask, well, what, what exactly was the gospel then? Well, gospel, remember, means good news. And the good news is real simple. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. 
that he purchased our forgiveness. He was raised on the third day. And that resurrection is evidence that tells us his death satisfied the death penalty that all of us have charged against us. Did you know that? That you're under the death penalty because of your sin. But the good news is we can be forgiven of all of our sins. And in being forgiven all our sins, we reconnect with the God who created us and who prepared a future that was always meant for us to experience. But none of us here on earth have ever done that. We haven't been able to experience it because of sin. You know what the crazy thing is about all this? All you have to do is accept what he's done. That's it. And you are the big prize winner. And that's awesome. But just like you see what's happening all around us today, there's a degeneration of thought and degeneration of action among people. And they too, like we see today, you know, it's all over. And, and when we hear people talking and on the news, they were saying, we know what's really best for me. I know what's best for me. And, you know, what God says, well, that's, that's old-fashioned. You know, that's old stuff. It's out of date, out of date. And, and we've got other folks that really know the truth, you know, and all that. And they're letting us in on what the, what the reality really is about God, about life. You know, we, didn't need to do, we don't need to do this old stuff anymore. And the new guys that are bringing this stuff to us, they're rock stars. They're rock stars, headline politicians. The people who everybody wants to hear and everyone wants to talk about. That was the same kind of thing that was going on in Corinth. It's, we see that today. And poor Paul, they're probably saying, bless his heart. He's not the same level as these other guys. We progressed. And probably that Paul, he wasn't really God's guy like he thought he was anyway. We've got new apostles here. Well, under these new apostles, all kinds of destructive behavior was either overlooked or even idolized. But Paul is throwing down the gauntlet and saying, hey, I was there once with you, told you what you needed to do, what you needed to stop doing. I was gracious. I was there twice, and I wasn't condemning. I won't do it a third time. We're going to settle this. You're going to do what God has called you to do because I have authority that God has given me. Now, to our ears, <laughs> that's sounding like something maybe harsh and maybe even unkind. But what you have to remember is this. The stakes are incredible. Paul is reminding them and us through this, this isn't a game. It's life and everything is important. And we are accountable for what we believe and how we live with that belief. Because everything you're going to be and going to experience after this world, after this world, depends on what you do now. And like the old African saying goes, nobody gets out of life alive. Nobody gets out of life alive. And then the Bible says judgment. So he's saying, hey, you've got you to you know, straighten up and fly right. So here we go. Now we get to our second point. Now I'm going to take you back in time here. Because what he is, he's just like Popeye the sailor man. You remember Popeye? <laughs> Well, listen, see if you can tie it together. I will give you all the proof you want that Christ speaks through me. Christ is not weak when he deals with you. He is powerful among you. Although he was crucified in weakness, he now lives by the power of God. We too are weak, just as Christ was. But when we deal with you, we'll be alive with him and we will have God's power. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you failed the test of genuine faith. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. Anybody out there remember Popeye the Sailor Man? I remember as a kid getting up on Saturday mornings, black and white TV, and they would have Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, if you're not familiar with that, Popeye was a little sailor. And he had big arms and everything, but he was he could get pushed around. And, you know, and there were guys that would pick on him and he'd have to try to rescue his girlfriend, Olive Oil, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he just couldn't do it until 
he got a can of spinach. And when he ate that spinach and it was inside of him, he was unbeatable. It was what was in him that made all the difference in the world. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, here, you question my authority. You see, I'm not nearly as powerful sounding as these other teachers that you've surrounded yourself with. But he says, I'll give you proof that this Jesus we taught speaks through me. And then he goes, what about this Jesus we worship? He's weak, right? He was crucified. I mean, that's pretty weak, isn't it? You know, he looked like he was going to take the world by storm. Palm Sunday comes riding in on a donkey. And then what happens? He goes from king on Sunday and is executed as a criminal on Friday. Didn't see that coming. But Sunday, Sunday came and he rose again. He not only paid for sin, but he kicked the tar out of death itself. You see, he says, you look at us as weak. But when we come back, it's the power of Jesus in us that you're going to see coming through us. Because that's what Jesus does when he's working through men and women. And the bottom line here, as he's talking to these Corinthians, is you have been conned. You were taken in by false teachers. You bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. And then Paul kind of flips the argument on its head and says, now, you're thinking, we're the real stuff or not? Well, how about you? How about you? Is your faith real? And that's a question that each of us need to make sure is settled in our own lives. Is your faith real? But then he says, you need to stand for the truth. In verse 7, he says, we pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Do the right thing before we come even if that makes it look like we have failed to demonstrate our authority. For we cannot uh, oppose the truth. We must always stand for the truth. We're glad to seem weak if it helps show that you are actually strong. We pray that you will become mature. I'm writing this to you before I come, hoping that I won't need to deal severely with you when I do come. For I want to use the authority the Lord has given me to strengthen you not to tear you down. Correction. To change things. To make a mistake right. I remember when I was in college, uh, we did not have computers. There was actually one guy on my dorm floor that had a computer. His dad worked for Lockheed. And, you know, he had a computer. Nobody else did. But we had typewriters. And I had this beautiful electric portable typewriter. And it was wonderful. And the thing was, you know, I'd type up papers and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, if you're on a computer today, you make a mistake, you just go back up. Oh, well, let's correct that and get a spell check. And I remember I'd make a mistake typing. And I'd think, oh, no, I've got to go back and type the whole thing over. And then the miracle took place. Somebody invented erasable typing paper. Oh, it was the best thing ever. And what you do, you know, you didn't live in this time, but you'd go back and you'd find the letter and you'd erase it with a pencil eraser. It would actually take it out and it'd look really clean. And then, you know, especially what would happen is that you'd miss one letter. You know, it was supposed to be E-A or E-I or something and you just put the I in. And you had to put two letters in. You'd take your typewriter and squeeze it together to get them in there. And that's how you'd work it. But at least you didn't have to type the whole page over again. Correction is important. And the key verse there is, is eight. He says, you know what? He says, we cannot oppose the truth. We cannot do anything against the truth. He says, we need to correct according to the truth. In every age... There'll be plenty of people who will try to tear down God's word. It started from day one. Day one. They'll disagree with what's in it. It's okay. It's not a new thing. 
the thing is, is that you can't kill the truth. What you can do is silence the truth, but you can't kill it. You can't kill it. And so what we see in God's word is God doesn't say, go out there and defend the truth. God doesn't say we have to defend the truth. He says, declare it. Give it out. Well, what if they don't agree? That's their problem. I mean, you pray for them, respond to them positively, but they are responsible for what happens next once they get the truth. And, you know, that's where we get this stuff, too, where people say, well, you know, well, how, how could this God send people to hell? He doesn't. People paddle their own canoes that way. They do it by themselves. What you're doing, though, is you're giving people a fighting chance. Let them hear the truth. And that's where the battle is, to make sure they get a chance to hear the truth. You see, to suppress what God has said in the Bible, the conversation in our culture today goes, uh, you know, something like this. I don't believe what you believe. Me as a Christian? Okay. Just, you can believe whatever you want. Well, I don't like what you believe. Well, okay. I'm sorry. Well, you need to change your mind and agree with what I say about life and love and morality. And I say, I, I can't. I, I believe that God knows best. You're a hater. <laughs> no, what I'm doing is I'm just telling you what I know is the truth. You see, one of the hardest things for us to deal with is our pride. We never want to be told that we're wrong, that we need to be corrected. I mean, I don't like it. Nobody does. But Paul is telling them that even if these people don't want to accept the authority he has as an apostle, he says, I hope, I hope that you will still choose to do the right thing in your life. Do the right thing as a church. And here is that whole issue of the truth. And that's what we struggle with. Every culture struggles with this, grapples with this whole issue of the truth what is the truth I, is there such a thing as truth or how can you know the truth well the bible claims that it is truth now, i know what you're thinking yeah but there are a ton of people who not only think it's not the truth but they downright hate the bible well okay but what you have to remember is that it's either true or it's not true you get to choose you get to believe whatever you want. And the thing about it is people who hate the Bible, hate what it says, usually don't have lightning strike them down or die of a horrible disease. No, God is gracious. He wants people to come to know him and his love. But whatever you choose about what God's word says, that's what you're going to live with for all eternity. So you better be right. So is there such a thing as truth? Sure there is. Sure there is. And we're responsible for accepting the truth of who God is and what he has done for us as a human race. But for us as individuals. Well, how can you know the truth? Well, here's the problem. God says that all of us have been exposed to a deadly disease. And we've got it. And it's not COVID-19. All of us have caught it. No one is without it. And this disease is called sin. And what sin does is it causes us to not be able to see the reality that's out there. So what's the answer? God says that when we come to him, humbly accept him as our creator and our savior, he says in me, you can know the truth. Well, how do I make somebody know the truth? You can't can't do it you can't make somebody do it it's beyond your human capability well how can they come to know the truth you pray for them you pray and ask god to work in their hearts because this coming to the knowledge of the truth is a work of god's holy spirit and that's why paul writes here in verse 9 he says we pray that you will become mature. He wants them to grow up in their understanding of the truth that God allows us to see. 
And he's praying that God will do his work in them. And as you listen to what Paul is writing here, it may seem harsh to you. I mean, it, it did to me, too. And, and certainly to one who doesn't know God or or what is it at stake for those who don't know God? You say, wow, this this almost hurts reading it. But Paul says, I don't want to tear you down. But I've been given authority to speak for God. Whoa, that's kind of brazen, isn't it? He says, that authority is being used by me not to take you apart. But I want to be a part of putting you together the way God wants you to be. You see, Paul is serious about their lives because he knows what they have missed in not giving themselves totally to Christ and what they will miss living in a way that could have drawn them close to the God of the Bible. He loves them enough to say, I won't let you settle for second or even third best in your lives. I want the best for you. And then he closes it. In this great letter, he has this last part, wanting the best for you. Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. All of God's people here send you their greetings. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, if you've tracked with us over the last 13 weeks of this letter, some of the stuff that he's hit them with was tough and painful. They would strayed off the, the ranch there quite a bit. But he knows that his job is to give them the chance to be the very best they can be in this life. For this Jesus that they've already proclaimed they love. So he tells them to be joyful. Go for the gold in your life. Let God do all he wants to do in your life. They encourage each other. You're a family. You need each other. It's a tough world out there. And then love each other in such a way that you'll live in harmony and in peace. And then there's a promise that comes behind this. It's built in here. He says, if you will do these things, then the God of love and peace will be with you. And he reminds them that this is the God I'm asking you to embrace, asking you to hold true to, the God who's the source of love and peace. And then in that culture, kisses were used as a sign of affection for friends and for family. He says, do that. And then he reminds them there are a lot of folks who are pulling for you. All of you in Corinth, and they want you to know through their greetings that they're for you too. And then that last bit, the closing of this really unique letter, he asks that three things be with them, these people that he really loves. Grace. That's been the issue the whole time. Not works or ceremony or tradition, but grace. Grace. The undeserved gift of God to humans that we either accept or reject. And then love, the love of God. That's what this is all about. He says, I don't want you to miss the love of God. And then fellowship, the daily closeness with God that comes from the Holy Spirit drawing your heart close to the heart of God. He says, these are the things that I'm fighting for. Because these are the things that are worth fighting for. And he says, I do this because I love you so much. And that's how the letter ends. But there are three last things. Three last things to take from this letter before we go. And the first one is, is never forget that the world we live in naturally winds down. It's called the second law of thermodynamics, if you're a physics person. What it means is that hot things always cool unless you do something to stop them. Well, what it is is expressing a fundamental, simple truth about the universe. That disorder, they call it a quantity known as entropy, always increases. 
we go from order to disorder. This is physics. It's a law of physics, the truth, because we can observe that law in action in our universe. What that means is that uh, if you don't do something to stop the deterioration, then things will go from good to worse. And that includes your spiritual life, too. And that's what Paul is saying. I saw something this week. It was crazy. There was a contest that they designed. I think it was back in the 1950s. I'm assuming this was true. I'm reading this stuff. What they did was they took a brand new car and they created this vault. I think it was some city in Oklahoma. It might have been Oklahoma City even. But it was some city. And then they lowered this car, beautiful, brand new car, down into this vault. And it wasn't like encased, you know, in such where it was damaging the car. It was just sitting in kind of a box. Then they sealed it over. And the thing was is that they were going to leave it for 50 years. So that after 50 years, they would open it up, have a contest, and would have a winner. And the winner would have this pristine car that for 50 years has been preserved like, you know, in a pyramid or something. And boom, you'd have this wonderful thing. And sure enough, they dug it up. And I'm not sure exactly when it was they did it. And they pulled out the car after 50 years of it being sealed up. And do you know what it looked like? It was a rusted hulk. Nothing on it worked. It was just one big piece of rust. The whole thing had deteriorated. It was horrible. Everybody was so disappointed. But they learned something about it, that they hadn't added anything to it. Moisture probably got in and such, and it just deteriorated, broke everything down. And they compared it to somebody who had one of these cars, kept it, kept it up, you know, probably repainted it, maybe redid the upholstery, all this stuff, and it was gorgeous, but it had been used all this time and kept up. And then this one that had been kept in the box was nothing. You know, when you come to this Jesus of the Bible, you can't just put that experience in a hole in the ground and expect that to look like much in the end. You know that car? Had that picture of one that had been lovingly cared for and maybe even restored to some degree. It was beautiful. You need to do that in your life too. With your faith. The faith that you have. To keep working on it. Caring for it. You know, you're doing that today just by, you know, those of you who are in church, going to be in church with me or at least listening to God's word here. Hang in there. Be sure you're in the faith. Paul wanted to make sure that these people he loved so much were not just fans of Jesus, but they were in the family of Jesus. Take care of your faith. Nurture it. If you don't use it, if you don't build on it, if you don't mature in it, remember that second law of thermodynamics. No matter how hot it was when you started, if you don't do something to prevent it, it'll grow cold on you. And the colder it gets, the less life there is in it. And the thing about it, you say, well, that's just me. It's not. Because whatever happens to you not only affects you, but affects everyone you live in contact with. We're all tied together, including those people that you love so very much. They can't catch a faith from you that's grown cold, that's rusted over. You say, well, yeah, but, you know, I, I'll be in heaven. Well, maybe you will be. But what about all the people and family that you love here? Will they? You see, you're the best chance they have of being swept up by God's Spirit and changed into the likeness of Christ. You will influence everyone in your life. And you need more than a faith that's grown cold from neglect. Second thing. Remember that Paul doesn't want judgment here. Now, make sure you don't miss what's happening in this letter. I bet you've had this happen. Have you ever thought, you know, somebody that's done, done you wrong, you go, wow, I sure hope God takes you down a notch there, buddy. 
Hope you get what you deserve. Paul, he really sets an example for one who stands as a leader in the church of Jesus. They've been coming after him, tearing him down, all kinds of things of opposition against him. You know what his response is? I hope you do well. I hope you will be all that God wants you to be. I hope that you succeed in your Christian life. Now, remember that these are people that he's poured out his heart. He's sweating over them, prayed over them, done all this. And they've turned away from what he has fought to build in their lives. How does he then look at these people with a positive spirit? How do you do that? The way that you preserve love for people and to have that desire for them to succeed when maybe they've hurt you, is to constantly pray for them. How many times have you had somebody do something wrong to you? You've had that happen. All of us have. They've hurt you, embarrassed you, or made your life miserable, disappointed you. And the temptation is you say, you know, I'd just love to see you get, you know, what you deserve. What can you do besides wanting them to fail? Pray for them. Pray for them. You say, they don't deserve it. You're right. But you're praying for them as a work of grace, not obligation. And all of us have to have that grace. You see, when we're walking strong with the Lord, we can choose to do that for others. But it takes supernatural input to do it. You can't do it by yourself. And how do you get that? Again, it's by prayer, by praying. You say, well, I I just don't like them. Then pray for them. Because what you don't realize is that God brings those people into your life. He's allowed them to come. And do you know why? To change your heart. See, who knows? Your prayers might change them in the end as well. But the key here is that not that you're supposed to go out there and change every bad person who's ever hurt you, but I know there's somebody that you're maybe still angry with that's treated you unfairly. And you can even point to them today of what they've done. Make your case for why you're mad at them in life. But you can't be hostile towards people for whom you constantly pray, pray for. You see, the thing we forget sometimes is about prayer, that it works in two different ways. It changes other people's lives. You can influence the world around you by praying. But when you pray and pray continually for someone, your heart will be changed. And you begin to want to see them become who God wants them to be. And instead of judgment and punishment, you want them to become the best that God can make them. And that's who the Apostle Paul was. And that's what he demonstrated here in this letter to us. Well, last thing is a question. So what happened? You know, we just ended here. He says, you know, we're going to pray for you. I'm coming to town. You know, we're going to settle things up, see what's going on. And then it just ends. And we have nothing else. If you've tracked with us in this unique letter that Paul wrote to this church, you have to wonder, what happened here? Are are we left in the dark? Not so much. See, the question is, how in the world did these Corinthian Christians respond to this letter that's really a warning bell for them? Did they take it in a positive way and say, yeah, we need need to move with the correction and all that, or did they just blow him off? You know, as a part of this letter, Back in chapter 10, if you go back there, you'll find in that chapter, Paul says that he would not go beyond these folks, these Corinthian folks, until their faith had grown solid. He said, I'm not going anywhere, not going to do anything else, not leaving you until you grow solid in your faith. And as best we can tell, he did go to Corinth after he wrote this letter. And the belief is that he was there for three months. And during that time, Some scholars say that that's when he wrote another letter, one that we've already looked at and was sent to the church in Rome. We know the letter simply as the book of Romans. 
But what he wrote to the Romans is important. At the end of that letter, he says this. There is no more work that needs to be done in this region. My work here is completed. The mission is accomplished. They listened and they acted. And they gave themselves to the life and the work that God wanted for them. And the Corinthian church became a key player in all that God was going to do in this area. And so Paul says at the end of that letter to the Romans, I can come to you now because all is done and all is well in this whole region. The Apostle Paul, he told the truth and they believed the truth. They lived the truth, and God honored them for that. And if we should do the same, we could leave this life feeling like we indeed have succeeded in life to the fullest. So my friends, there ends Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're you're such a God who loves us, a God of the second chance, third chance, umpteenth chance. You, you, you just keep pouring out your love and grace. And Lord, that's what it was all about here. Understanding grace, not rules, regulations, not mysterious things, none, none of that stuff. Just the grace of God, the gift that you give to us. And knowing that grace of God, being able to share that grace from our hearts to others. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you too that in all that we've seen here, we see people who are in just a crazy moral morass here of that town of 250,000 people. And Lord, it was chaos there. And yet, God, you birthed a church and you took people who were struggling against the culture and they stood firm. And Lord, they chose to live the life you wanted them to live. They did it. They did it. And I thank you for that. And I pray that for us in this day, in this time, we're confronted with the same kind of issues, the same kind of culture, same kind of stuff. That you'd help us to rise up and to be like those Corinthian Christians. That people would say of us that we did all that we needed to do. We became all that we needed to be. And that we were the people that God had always dreamed for us to be in his kingdom. Father, thank you for that. If you're here today and you're listening and, and you've never made a commitment to Christ, or maybe you're not sure, maybe, maybe your commitment is a lot like that old car from the 50s that was buried. Maybe you, maybe you started off something great and it just kind of faded away. Today's the day to come back because God always allows us to make that comeback, get that second chance. And today all you need to do is come to him and say, Lord, I want to get back on, or I want to get on for the first time. I want you to come into my life. I'm going to agree with the truth that the Bible says. I'm going to believe it's truth that Jesus died on the cross, and in dying on the cross, that he paid for my sin. And Lord, I pray that you would just remind me again and again of your goodness and love and mercy and all of those wonderful things that you give to us. And Father, we thank you again for all your good gifts. And Lord, we thank you that when we accept you, that that life begins all over again in a brand new way that will last forever. Thank you, Father, for all this love that you pour out and for the love that the Apostle Paul had for these Corinthian Christians. And we pray that we'll continue to be blessed in that same way. We love you now and we pray these things in the great and wonderful name of Jesus himself. Amen. Well, that's the end of our time today and the end of second corinthians we're off on a new adventure next week it'll be a surprise but by golly we're going to be back in the word of god so i'd like to bless you before you take off today and we'd like to invite you to come out and join us right here at quail a community church and remember you're always welcome to join the family here and as soon as you walk in the doors we consider you family so receive this benediction now now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all today. Remember, God loves you. We love you too. And we'd love to see you out here some Sunday. God bless you all. Bye-bye for now.